You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Good morning and welcome to this future forum, The Future of the Green Economy, A Path to Recovery. On behalf of the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation, I'd like to welcome you for joining us today. We have a special showcase presented by California State University Dominguez Hills. My name is Shane Cullen, and I will be your Zoom tech for today. We have a star-studded program of presenters and panelists who will be sharing their insights with you today. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Introduce the CEO of the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation, Bill Allen. Thank you, Shane, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to our latest LAEDC Future Forum. Today's forum is on the future of the green economy as a path to recovery. I should first explain the Safer at Work logo uh, over my shoulder as part of a campaign the LADC has ongoing with the County of Los Angeles, a multimedia marketing campaign to create a community of caring around our essential workers who are still at work while so many of us are able to work from home uh, to slow the spread of the virus. We wanna keep them, uh, the patrons of their businesses, the community that surrounds them all as safe as possible when they're in the work environment. So hopefully you'll help us spread those messages. Given that the LADC's vision is to reimagine and reinvent our regional economy, to advance not only growth and recovery, but also inclusion, sustainability, resilience, and social mobility, I can assure you that we do in fact see the future of our green economy as a path not only to recovery in our region, but towards all of those aspirational goals in our vision statement. This whole series of future forums has been going on for about three years now as we encourage all stakeholders in our business, education, government, labor, and environmental communities to focus more on the future, to think about what is around the corner and how we best prepare our region, its industries, and its workforce to help shape and benefit from that future. As such, we're indebted to our founding partner and presenting sponsor in this series, California State University Dominguez Hills, for making these forums possible with their generous financial and intellectual support of each and every one of these forum events. California State University Dominguez Hills is a diverse, welcoming community of learners and educators collaborating to change lives and communities for the better. With strong academic programs, dedicated faculty mentors, supportive staff, and many campus amenities, CSU Dominguez Hills is committed to connecting students to a high quality and transformative education while providing our communities with a vital resource for diverse talent, knowledge, skills, and leadership needed to thrive today and tomorrow. Now I'd like to turn the platform over to my good friend and partner in these future forum efforts, also a deeply engaged member of the executive committee of the LADC and the 11th president an outstanding leader of California State University, Dominguez Hills, Dr. Thomas Parham. Dr. Parham, the platform is yours. Thank you, Bill, uh, and good morning to everyone. And let me add my voice to the chorus of those today that have said welcome to this version of our future forum. Uh, as Bill said, I am Dr. Thomas Parham, president of California State University, Dominguez Hills. And on behalf of our 17,700 students, our illustrious faculty, our committed and devoted staff and senior executives, and the over 100,000 alumni from our campus. I want to bring you greetings and I'm honored to serve as host for this LAEDC Future Forum. I want to thank, first of all, Bill and the LAEDC for <clears throat> continuing to sponsor these important forums in virtual format throughout the pandemic for bringing together the forward-thinking panelists who are joining us today. While virtual formats have tapped down some of our in-person face-to-face engagement, it has not dissipated the issues that are there. And I'm delighted, in fact, that we are partnering with the LAEDC to bring these virtual forums to you. Now, the focus of today's forum is the future of the green economy and where exactly such initiatives fit into our region's post-pandemic economic recovery. So even as we have sheltered in place and work from our homes, me from my office uh, at my home, much attention has been focused on what the world and its economic 
uh, uh, status will look like when we emerge on the other side of this crippling pandemic. Now, in my mind, and at Cal State University Dominguez Hills, it should be this green economy an alternative to traditional economic models that we should be considering. Because some of those models increase inequities, they increase waste, they uh, threaten the environment. And what I'm looking for from our panelists are conversations that help us to create ideas and, and foster uh, narratives that are inclusively more green, that improves human well being, that builds social equity, while also reducing environmental risk. And I think you'll be excited as you listen to today's leaders on the forum. So our leaders who are joining us today believe that the transition to a green economy will be central to our post COVID economic recovery. And by moving toward a more sustainable and renewable economy and environment, the South Bay will be able to create exciting new opportunities in a wide range of industries. So today we'll hear from these industry leaders and they'll speak on a variety of intriguing topics, including how the pandemic has impacted and changed the industry and how local companies are pivoting in response to the new government policies and initiatives that you'll hear about. We'll hear about enormous economic impact that the burgeoning green economy has on Southern California and how sustainable practices are beginning to be hardwired into the local industry. It's becoming a part of our DNA. Now here at California State University, Dominguez Hills, your California State University, Dominguez Hills, we're proud of the efforts we have made towards sustainable and energy efficiency. And I'm excited to hear about any new innovations and ideas that the university can utilize in those efforts. The exciting developments in the green economy promise to bring capital, jobs, and innovation to Los Angeles as we move out of this pandemic. And your California State University, Dominguez Hills, plans to work with you every step of the way. Cal State University, Dominguez Hills' ongoing partnership with industry leaders are central to our mission of student success. And by working with forward thinking, innovative leaders like those joining us today, we will be able to continue to position our graduates for success and provide local industry with the talent and creativity they need to grow and thrive. And so as I get ready to turn this back over to my friend, good friend, Bill Allen, I wanna wish all of you a happy holiday season, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa for those who celebrate that and a prosperous and happy new year. And let me encourage you to be safe, be well, and be blessed. So thank you once again to the LAEDC for hosting this event. Let me now turn it back over to Bill Allen who will introduce our first feature presenter. Thank you very much. Can I just take a minute and say how fortunate we are in the LA region to have a leader of the caliber of Dr. Thomas Parham running California State University to make his hills. Thank you, Dr. Parham, for setting the context for our forum so well this morning and for your commitment to your students and the future vibrance and sustainability of our entire region. We're really grateful to you. It's my honor now to introduce our first featured speaker on the green economy this morning. Nancy Ander is the deputy director of the Office of Sustainability at the California Department of General Services. Nancy's responsibilities include the development of sustainability policies in areas such as net zero carbon buildings and implementation of sustainability programs such as energy efficiency retrofits, solar and wind installations, electric vehicle infrastructure development, recycling and other programs for our state facilities. Prior to her role with the state, she was a manager at Southern California Edison. And prior to that, she supported public policy at the California Energy Commission, where notably, she developed and managed the first public interest research program for energy efficiency at the CEC and helped lead the program to national prominence. We're delighted to have her with us this morning. Nancy, the platform is yours. Thank you so much, Bill. I really appreciate the introduction. And I, I also was, um, very inspired by President Parham's words and um, it's a hard, hard presentation to follow, but I'm gonna do my best here. So what, what I really wanted to do today is share with all of you, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm very honored to be part of the forum. I've, I've heard about it and I know it's a great um, venue for all of you to have this dialogue, this ongoing dialogue that's really relevant. 
that um, I'm honored to be here. What I want to do is share with you some of the key initiatives that the state is doing and how it relates to the green economy going forward, because there's a very close correlation. And, and I think that um, what we're doing at the state needs to be an example and it needs to be leading the way with what we're asking the rest of the community to be doing. So I want to share with you some some insights on um, some of our programs and our directions going forward. So next slide, Shane. So just to give you a little bit of background about the Department of General Services, we're, we're basically the state's business manager. We provide a variety of services um, and we, we manage a lot of the functions that go on in all of our state facilities. So you can think about it as similar to a commercial building we're driven by operational efficiency. We need to reduce our utility bills. We need to limit our, uh, we, we need to use our limited resources very efficiently. So similar to how all of you are thinking about running your commercial businesses. But at the same time, we are the state's business manager. And so we're driven by policy goals also. We have to balance the, the goals that we have on a policy level because we're the chief implementation arm for all of our state facilities. So it's not always an easy balance. We have to consider cost considerations, but then we consider policy considerations. And sometimes the intersection of those is a, uh, is a tough balancing act. Next slide, Shane. Um, so what we do in our office is we set some policy right now, you know, there's a huge focus on zero net energy, but we're definitely turning the corner in terms of shifting to a zero carbon policy and we're developing that now. And then some of the programs that we're focusing are on energy efficiency retrofits, on-site renewables at state facilities. That means mostly solar and wind, we're starting to look at storage and off-site renewables. So this is an interesting concept that we've used to bundle with our renewables portfolio. So not just solar at the site, but off-site uh, frequently in front of the meter at the utility. And then lastly, electric vehicle infrastructure. So these are sort of our priority programs that we're focusing on right now. I wanna give you some, some very brief background on, on what's driving a lot of our work and um, there have been a number of executive orders and legislation over the years. B1812, which was um, established by Governor Brown was uh, one of the huge drivers that have, have steered our direction for many years. It in fact set a goal of 50% of the square footage of state buildings to be zero net energy by 2025. And I think at the time they said it, it seemed like a very far away goal. And now 2020, it seems like it's around the corner. So we're, um, I'm, I'm gonna share with you a little bit of our progress there. Uh, B4818, we set some pretty aggressive goals for electric vehicles in California. Um, again, we, we see transportation as the, the biggest contributor to carbon emissions in the state. So without a focus on, on uh, carbon emissions from the transportation sector, we're not gonna make a big dent in this area. Um, B5518, we're looking at um, carbon neutrality by 2045. Similarly, SB100 establishes a 100% renewable portfolio standard by 2045. And so I'm throwing all of these you know, executive orders at you, I'm trying not to, to bore you to tears with, with just hearing about historically what, um, what we've legislatively or executive, you know, have executive orders on. But I think it's important context because it gives you a snapshot of where directionally the state sees policy priorities going forward. So EO in 1919 is Governor Newsom's executive order. It essentially reinforced everything that has been done under the Brown administration. But going forward, it, it also uh, introduces some, some new interesting things. What N1919 did was it introduced the, the value of the state's investments. So one of the things that 
it focused on is creating a climate investment framework for the state, meaning that for our $700 billion portfolio of investments, our CalPERS, CalSTRS, University of California, $700 billion of uh, investment potential, there's a direction now to essentially focus those investments um, at a much higher extent on uh, organs companies that are essentially considering climate risk in their business operations and their business decisions. And, and this is a, a focus not just for advocacy of climate change as a priority in terms of policy, it's essentially a recognition that the administration sees companies that are focusing on climate risk as the best investments financially. They're the most secure investments financially because they are positioning themselves to be successful under a climate change um, planet. And so I think, you know, this is really a, a groundbreaking executive order in that, again, it reinforces everything we've been doing, but it goes farther in terms of looking at how um, our financial investments need to shift because that's where California will be able to prosper going forward. And then on a you know, smaller scale, in terms of our DGS policies, we have a ZNE first policy, meaning every building we design and build uh, needs to be designed to be zero net energy first, unless there are overriding barriers to that um, direction. And then we have a ZEV first policy as well, meaning that every fleet vehicle we purchase needs to be a zero emission vehicle unless there's an overriding reason that it can't such as a um, safety vehicle or law enforcement um, whatever functionality might prevent it but essentially both z and e and zevs are are a uh, priority in all of our acquisitions and decision making So just a, a quick snapshot for you of what we're currently doing on the retrofit side. We've, uh, over the last few years, have saved about 20 million kilowatt hours just with our energy retrofit projects. Those are an ongoing priority for us. On the renewable side, we have a goal of installing 100 megawatts by 2022. Um, and uh, next year, it'll be eight, eight megawatts to contribute to that, but we're on target to reach our 100 megawatt goal. And then lastly, on EV charging infrastructure, we're installing 200 ports next year with a, um, with a goal of um, an additional 2,500 ports by 2025. So we have you know, pretty aggressive goals in all of these areas. We're definitely running into some workforce issues because um, of the rapid rate of acceleration of these programs. We're, we're not seeing the um, available skilled workforce um, as, as available as we need them to be for the pace at which we're implementing these projects. So this is certainly an area where we definitely are looking to the additional uh, workforce um, supporting this work. So where are we headed next? We're definitely um, focusing more on clean transportation. Um, there was a recent executive order by Governor Newsom requiring 100% of sales of new passenger vehicles be zero emission by 2035. Again, it sounds far away, but it, for me, it feels like around the corner because there's a lot that has to be done in terms of building the infrastructure, the charging networks to support that um, in the next 10 years to make that reality. And then secondly, battery storage. We're seeing a convergence of issues that are making on-site battery storage really viable from an economic um, perspective. So Unfortunately, with our increase in uh, solar energy generation, that generation profile doesn't map really well to our rate structures, which have our highest peak rates in the early evening hours and our highest generation in the afternoon hours. And so battery storage has really emerged as a cost-effective and viable uh, solution to matching up that generation profile with where our highest utility costs end up being. So 
So we're looking at that not only for cost considerations, but also for resiliency. In California, we're running into power safety, power shutoffs on a regular basis now as um, wildfires become unfortunately a part of our um, ongoing life. And we're seeing battery storage as also an opportunity for adding resilience to, to our state facilities. So that, that's it for me. I wanted to give you a snapshot of what we're doing and where we're, we're focusing on. But I think that the main message I wanna leave is that this is a burgeoning area. It's, it's not growing little by little, it's growing a lot by a lot. It's really um, growing at a very accelerated pace. And um, as I mentioned, we're, we're finding that we're having a tough time finding the vendors to provide enough uh, manpower to support a lot of these projects, but it's not gonna slow down. And we see this as an area that we're gonna need um, a lot of a lot more help going forward. So that's it for me, Shane. I'm happy to take questions when when it's the right time. Terrific, Nancy. Thank you so much. It's so encouraging to see the progress our state is making on these bold and really important initiatives. Thank you for that update and look forward to your comments uh, on the panel. Our next speaker is Amisha Rai, Managing Director at Advanced Energy Economy, representing the advanced energy industry. Amisha oversees AEE's clean grid strategy in California, Colorado, and Nevada. And in this role, Amisha leads AEE's engagement with state policymakers and directs advocacy efforts to expand the market for advanced energy in the West. Prior to joining AEE, Amisha worked as a lobbyist in Sacramento, where she represented the State Chamber of Commerce on energy and climate issues. She has extensive experience advocating in front of state lawmakers and regulatory officials, and has spent time working on many important statewide campaigns. Amisha, we're delighted to have you with us this morning. The platform is yours. Thank you, Bill, and thank you to LAEDC and the leaders on this, this panel. Um, I am really pleased to be with you all this morning to talk about this important issue and, and kudos to all of you for, for raising this issue at this time. I think it's such an important topic as we continue to uh, battle through this, this global pandemic but are also obviously grappling with some pretty heavy questions around uh, the recession, the ongoing recession and what that means for our uh, our workers our, and, and our businesses around the state. So, um, it's, it's a great opportunity for us all to, to put our minds together. So I really want to focus in, um, so Nancy gave such a great background on sort of the state's leadership and, and where some of the focal points are moving forward. And, and I would agree with all of those um, from my perspective. And so what I'm going to share with you is what we're seeing from the advanced energy industry perspective, um, sort of how the the, the shutdowns and the pandemic have impacted the industry and, and how we do see a pathway to recovery and what opportunities we also see on the policy side to, to help support that recovery. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on advanced energy economy, as Bill mentioned, um, I oversee our Western states engagement um, for AWE and, and our membership includes the broad array of technologies that encompass the advanced energy industry. So that's anything from the energy efficiency uh, companies, uh, companies that are involved in demand response, smart grid technologies, battery storage, um, distributed solar, uh, re large scale renewables, advanced transportation, including obviously um, EV charging, um, as well as um, some of the, the manufacturers in that space. Um, and so we, we really do encompass the broad um, band of uh, advanced energy, clean energy and transportation technologies. And so we've really taken a look at um, how all of these industry segments have been impacted by the pandemic and um, the shutdowns that have obviously been a part of um, you know, mitigating the, 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 the pandemic issues. So um, one thing that I wanted to, to pinpoint for you all is a couple of data points. And, and thank you, Shane, for bringing up the, the, the slide. Um, this is the only slide I wanted to share with you all to really uh, focus in on a, on a few data points that, that we see from our end and that we've taken a look at. Um, Every year, AWE does conduct uh, a, a job studies to just sort of uh, catalog and, and uh, 
provide some data around the, the number of advanced energy jobs and the breadth of those jobs um, in various states across, across the country and the, the states that we work in. Um, in 2019, California was home to um, over half a million advanced energy jobs. And again, that spans the entire um, technology uh, base for clean energy and transportation. Um, in just March, when the pandemic was, that when the pandemic hit um, the US obviously and, and numbers were rising um, and the first sort of shutdown was, was called, we saw um, over 20,000 advanced energy jobs um, lost in just California alone. And, and that was just in March. That's the data from March. We've seen obviously some of that expand over um, the, over throughout the year. Um, and, and some of that is due to obviously just the, the shutdown itself. Um, there was also obviously uh, the guidance around how and who can be out there working was also still sort of in development. This was the first time, obviously, the state was grappling with something like this um, and with very, you know, limited understanding of sort of how like, and how COVID um, will impact uh, sort of business engagement with consumers. So um, with, with sort of the lack of clarity around some of the guidance and sort of as counties were developing um, their own guidance for local businesses, we did see uncertainty in our, in our sector as well. Um, so the advanced energy sector by no means or industry was not immune to uh, the, the, the larger impact of the pandemic and, and the impact it had on, on our economy. Um, and, you know, I think as time has gone on, many of our businesses, our, our members have found ways to work within um, the guidelines. Um, obviously, the definition around what's an essential ser service has also um, been further developed to allow some of these uh, services and, uh, you know, uh, workforces to, to, to do what they need to do. Um, but there are still some segments that have struggled to to really get back to work um, under normal conditions. So, um, you know, we've seen some impacts, especially around uh, rooftop solar, where, you know, where, where there's a lot of, uh, you know, going to residential homes and, and businesses. And, uh, you know, it just, there wasn't, um, you know, universal guidance on how to do that. So we're still seeing sort of industry come get through that, uh, that, that period of uncertainty um, also, energy efficiency retrofits, right? Uh, as folks are working from home, in the home, and we're limiting uh, the number of the, the traffic uh, going in and out of homes, obviously that does have an impact on the ability to do key retrofits um, inside homes and local businesses. Um, so again, this, this has certainly impacted our industry um, and key segments of our industry, but we do also see on the other end, um, the opportunity for a lot of growth and for advanced energy to be really the center point for the economic recovery. Uh, so several months ago, we actually commissioned, um, AWE commissioned a report by the analysis group to really look at what um, impact a stimulus type package would have on um, the California economy. And uh, this, this was modeled based off of really a focus around, you know, $100 billion clean energy stimulus package for California. Now, at the end of the day, whether it's $100 billion, $50 billion, or something else, um, the, the results are that, you know, for every dollar that was kicked in to as sort of energy, clean energy stimulus, you get a seven-fold return on that dollar, which is which is huge, right? That that have that sort of exponential return on initial investment um, poses or allows for both direct benefits to the state economy, but also indirect benefits as well. So, you know, in in that study, it shows not only do you put folks back to work, you increase the workforce, but you also have increased local and state tax revenue. Um, to see the state benefits from and local communities benefit from. So from an economic development point of view, from a local economic development point of view, investing um, in local clean energy projects, um, investing in the advanced energy sector 
um, and getting folks uh, back to work, accelerating um, those project pipelines really does create um, a stimulus effect that, that benefits the entire economy. The, the study also looked at key segments that are crucial to the economic recovery and found a lot of promise around energy efficiency, which is not a surprise uh, of sort of the 500,000 jobs that, have, that make up our advanced energy workforce in California. Energy efficiency jobs are a big part of that. Um, it's a big job driver. Um, and they're, they're good jobs that uh, produce a lot of work. So it is, it's not a surprise that uh, investing in an energy efficiency retrofits projects would, could be a boon for the local economies um, throughout the state. Also investment in renewable energy generation, which also produces really good jobs. Um, and uh, a lot on the infrastructure side is, is also uh, a plus plus for the state. And then Nancy touched on um, electric transportation as one of the key areas where there's a lot of potential for growth. Um, and, and we also saw that in this study that there's a lot of opportunity as the, the state moves forward on its clean transportation goals to, to not only support sort of the manufacturing side of the advanced transportation sector um, when it comes to the vehicles that's light, medium, and heavy duty, but also um, the, the need for build out of the infrastructure itself. And, um, and, and all that is needed to make sure that we are um, sustaining not only the vehicle side, but also making sure we have the infrastructure in place to support it. Um, so all of these, these buckets are certainly um, areas where the state can um, invest, and whether it's with state dollars or federal dollars, and I'll get to that in just a moment, where the state could see a lot of benefit in both direct and indirect um, benefits. And, and, you know, that's not just economic, right? And the more we invest in clean transportation, zero emission technologies, the better it is for, uh, for business activity, economic activity, but it also produces clean energy benefits or clean air benefits that our communities um, benefit from as well. So I'd like to just sort of quickly segue to some of the policy um, opportunities that we see uh, coming down the pike and, and as we move into 2021. Obviously, from a federal point of view, with the change in leadership um, at the top um, and sort of a, a, a new administration looking at how to um, mitigate the impact of the pandemic, but also how to stimulate the economy during a recession, uh, we do see the potential for uh, an infrastructure stimulus type uh, package that could um, be very helpful to the states, especially a state like California. Um, we do know that the incoming administration has talked a lot about the need for a stimulus package to be clean and green, uh, to, to really help local communities and to spur job growth. Um, we are excited to, to, to work with the, the new uh, administration on that. I think that as we, we move into January and as these conversations continue, what will be key is to ensure that the states have the flexibility to really plug dollars in where they can make the most impact. So many states, obviously, like California, have existing programs that um, grant out dollars for, for uh, various technologies, projects, et cetera. You know, it's going to be key to, to make sure we get those dollars out as quickly as possible um, and to uh, leverage existing pro uh, programs where, where it makes sense, but to also ensure that we are, we are uh, adding on additional capacity to, to stimulate the economy. Um, the, the other thing I just mentioned is when we're thinking about, again, especially the advanced transportation goals, um, in California and the new EO that the governor signed, which we're all really excited about, which phases out the sale of, uh, of fossil fuel vehicles um, after 2035, that, that executive order and implementing that executive order is going to be key, ensuring that not only the, the regulatory environment has the right uh, regs in place, but also making sure we have the right incentives in place to, to move um, that implementation forward in a way that's that's uh, cost effective and that brings new consumers into the market for, for all of uh, these technologies. 
Um, so we're really excited about the potential around um, you know, advanced transportation, about bringing some of the state goals in line with uh, a federal stimulus uh, proposal and ensuring that um, local communities can actually benefit from, from both of those venues working together. I will stop there and I will hand it back over to Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Amisha. That too was terrific. We really appreciate your perspective and the data you shared on the benefits of investing in advanced energy technologies, products, and services. This is all terrific context for our panel conversation coming up in just a moment. Um, and particularly as we prepare to welcome a new administration in Washington, which clearly recognizes such benefits to our economy and our environment. As we transition now to our expert panel, I do want to invite all of you in our audience this morning to join our conversation about the green economy as a path to recovery on social media by using the hashtag LAEDC Future Forum, both during and even after this morning's event. It's now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Judy Kruger, our LAEDC Senior Director for Strategic Initiatives and Industry Cluster Development. Judy leads our work in key aspects of the green economy, including supporting the growth of our zero emission vehicle industry here in LA region. Judy will introduce and moderate our distinguished panel of experts who include good friends and highly respected partners from Lacey, LADWP, and Cal State Dominguez Hills. Judy, the rest of the program is in your capable hands. And thank you, Bill. You're right. We have a really good group of uh, panelists coming up, and I am pleased to just move our conversation right along to the panelists. We're going to talk in, about the green economy and what that means for their particular departments. And first, I get to introduce Matt Peterson, President and CEO of the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. Matt. Thanks, Judy. Good to be with you. Good to be with everybody. Um, yeah, this is a, a really important historic moment we're in uh, as we transition into this new administration. Um, uh, so I know we'll talk about over the, that over the course of the panel. I think the uh, thoughts I would share as uh, CEO of Lacey, where we're doing a lot of work, of course, with startups um, uh, and workforce development. We have some some graduates of our program. Actually, we'll, we'll help connect with our uh, our colleagues here uh, that uh, said they needed some help on the workforce. Um, the you know I think there's a real opportunity here to take California's leadership and and more to the point LA's leadership, which LEDC has talked about in previous reports in which our transportation electrification partnership, of course, which DWP is a critical member, um, is working towards uh, to use the 2020 Olympics to accelerate progress on transportation electrification. Um, so we're really looking at how we not only get more light duty electric vehicles on the road by 2028, 30% of all the cars we uh, on the road, we want it to be electric by then, meaning 80% of the cars would have to be sold would be electric, 40% of all the heavy duty dredge trucks to be zero emissions by 2028 and all the charging infrastructure that's required. And we're working with USC on an economic opportunity report we'll release in early next year, but there's just an enormous amount of opportunity for LA to grow our economy, put people back to work and lead by example in creating a zero emissions future. So thanks for having me. And thank you, Matt. Next, I get to introduce Nancy Sutley, Chief Sustainability Officer for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Nancy. Uh, thank you very much. And it's, uh, it's great to be here uh, with this uh, distinguished panel and this important subject. Uh, LADWP, for, for those of you here in the city of Los Angeles, we are your water and electricity provider. And we're also a key part of LA's commitment uh, to uh, net zero carbon by 2050. Uh, so here at LADWP, we are in the midst of transforming both our water and power supplies uh, to um, help the city meet those uh, ambitious climate related goals. And what that really means is, is uh, helping to support uh, the initiatives to get to a zero carbon grid, a zero carbon buildings, um, zero carbon transportation, uh, zero waste of water. Uh, we're not so much involved in the zero waste uh, part of it, but doing our doing our part. And so, what that really means is, as I said, a, a wholesale transformation of the way that we provide water and power to the city of Los Angeles. Uh, we've cut our carbon emissions uh, almost in half, 
Uh, we get almost 40% of our power from renewable energy resources. Uh, we are sourcing more of our water locally and encouraging our uh, businesses and residents to save both water uh, and power uh, to help us meet those goals. Uh, and we also help to support the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. And someday we can reopen the La Crete's Innovation Campus um, where we're helping to sort of drive forward the clean energy economy here in Los Angeles through our investments, through our workforce, uh, and through our support of innovation um, in, in the water and power sector. Thanks. Thank you, Nancy. And next, let me bring to the virtual floor Dr. Finwin Prager, Associate Professor at CSU Dominguez Hills and Co-Director of the South Bay Economic Institute. Dr. Prager. Hi there, and thank you so much for having me on this panel with such esteemed company. Um, so I feel like I'm wearing three different hats here. So the first is as a representative of Dominguez Hills, and obviously we're interested in educated and educating and training both current and future workforce especially in these areas of the you know, emerging and the uh, development of the green economy in our region. So we have a fantastic Master of Science in Environmental Science program. We've also got an excellent Office of Sustainability. Shout out to Ellie Perry if she's on the call. And we really aim to be thought leaders and also practice leaders within our region. Now, the second hat as uh, co-director of the South Bay Economics Institute, you know, we're in, really interested in connecting with key South Bay organizations, such as our Workforce Investment Board in the South Bay, who do excellent work providing apprenticeships and training for individuals wanting to transition into these new opportunities. But also working with companies like Canoe, which is an electric vehicle innovator based in Torrance. And finally, as a researcher in environmental policy, um, especially climate policy, I've worked with other scholars on estimating the impacts of California's cap and trade policy way back in the late noughts. So I get what Nancy was talking about earlier, that there's this feeling of, oh, it's 2020 is now upon us. It felt like this long off, long distant goal in the past. Um, and the exciting thing is that we can now see some of the impacts of these policies on communities near Dominguez Hills, like uh, Watts, for example, which is receiving some of the transformative climate communities funds. And there's just really exciting work going on in that community to green that neighborhood and that um, many of the opportunities for citizens in that area. All right, thank you, Dr. Prager. So let's start the panel forum. And if I could bring uh, back Amisha and uh, Nancy Ander so we could have all five panelists uh, with their videos on. And also for those of you who are participating um, via Zoom, could you put in your questions in the Q&A. And for the next several minutes, we're gonna weave through the questions and pick around issues. One of the most compelling story that is coming through with all of our speakers is that uh, California is a state leader. This is so exciting to me to see that our economic recovery could happen through a tool where California is already ahead of the game in the green economy. And wh whether it's setting policy or the ecosystem of companies that are here, this is an exciting time like Nancy and, and, um, and others have said on the panel. So let's talk about that a little bit. Let's start with looking at the business side of the green economy when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurs. And what I want to ask is, um, Amisha, you have a uh, you have a membership that is that includes entrepreneurs, innovators, and they're all looking at the green economy. Tell me what you're seeing as far as entrepreneurship and innovation um, and some of the startup companies that you're intersecting with. Well, it's, it's interesting. So I, I think maybe some of the others may be able to speak to sort of the startup piece better than I, but I, I will say, Judy, when I first started working with AWE, we had more of the companies that were in sort of the startup phase that were sort of budding entrepreneurs and, and, and looking to, to do more in the state. But what we're seeing now is the stuff is here, right? That these, these technologies are, are mainstream. They are, um, working right now and uh, have the capacity to really um, work with the grid in so many different ways. I think what is interesting from, from my perspective and what I've seen um, within our membership is that more of our companies are working together. So you have advanced transportation companies working with you know, solar companies and storage companies and 
all of these different segments and technologies working together in a way that we, you know, that we haven't seen before. And I think that's what's most interesting to me is when we think about some of our grid challenges in California and in the broader West, honestly, um, with, with the extreme weather events and just everyone pulling renewable energy uh, at the time of the day, you know, that is going to be key. How, how all these technologies work together with, with the grid um, how uh, that impacts sort of the traditional grid infrastructure as well is going to be important. So I, I think that's what actually is most exciting from my point of view. And I'll let the others, especially Matt, may have more perspective on sort of in terms of the the, the you know the entrepreneur startup phase. But that that's what we're seeing a lot of in our membership and our company is doing today. Thank you. And Matt, she just queued it up to you. Yeah, perfect segue. Thank you, Misha. Uh, yeah, I mean, as Nancy said, uh, number one, we've got this incredible campus uh, that is uh, owned by the Department of Water and Power, and Lacey is uh, blessed to be the stewards of on behalf of the city and the utility. Um, right now, those entrepreneurs that normally would be buzzing about our hallways uh, are hard at work on Zoom, just like the rest of us, as well as um, in uh, facilities where they're assembling and manufacturing their goods to bring them to market. Of course, uh, for some, it's been a boom. I think one of our startups, Pick My Solar, has, has had record sales. Uh, you can check out solar.com, great way to buy a solar system for your home uh, and make it easy and make sure you get the best price and quality assurance is, is included in that. And um, others have taken their first uh, major commercial test flight, Ampere is making an electric airplane and they did the longest all electric uh, flight in California a few months ago and just completed their first flight on their first commercial route um, in Hawaii, uh, which is really exciting. And then emerging startups that are newer to our program like Charger Health. Uh, Camille, the founder and CEO is, is already signed up contracts to, to maintain and fix uh, EV charging stations for thousands of charging stations over the last few months. So we're really, uh, during this time, seeing some real momentum behind uh, these companies, which is great. And I will need to plug that we're, we're open for applications. If you're an entrepreneur and a founder and you want to be part of our ecosystem, apply now, go to laci.org and uh, fill out your application to be part of our next cohort of uh, clean tech startups. Good, thank you. And uh, Nancy, I want to bring your voice to the table here. Um, what are some of the, when we look at the big macro picture here, and the state goals and certainly at LADWP trying to um, increase the green, uh, green technology. What do you see some of the uh, barriers are, not just the pandemic, but in general, what do you think the barriers are to, uh, to growing the green economy and especially from the programs that you're trying to do? So one of the things I mentioned is some of the workforce gaps that we're seeing, and I'll give a couple of examples in the, um, infrastructure area, we require all of our contractors to be C10 contractors um, that are actually doing the infrastructure installation. And we've been fairly successful in some of our really larger urban areas in getting a sufficient number of bidders. But in the more remote areas, um, we've had bids that we've had to cancel because we didn't get uh, responders to that. So really having that skilled workforce available statewide has been an issue. And similarly, on the renewable side, um, this is an area that's burgeoning. We, you know, like I said, we're, we're installing another eight to 10 megawatts in 2021, but we're not the only ones competing for um, this limited skilled workforce. And what we're finding is that many of our contractors are slowing down on their projects. They're getting their, um, their employees lured away by other companies that you know, might be offering something better for them, whether it's flexibility or, or compensation. And so this is just an area, I think, of, of huge need that we're seeing some workforce gaps in. So talking about workforce, let's, uh, let's bring Dr. Prager to the floor and tell us about what's going on in the green economy and the workforce um, pipeline. I mean, that's such a big question, right? So there's, uh, I think the interesting thing is something that Amisha touched upon earlier that there's just so many different opportunities here, right? This, when we're talking about a green economy, we're talking about 
many different areas of our traditional economy. So we've got obviously the energy sector, we've got various different types of environmental consulting, we've got various different types of transportation nowadays, which is you know, a huge booming area, as Amisha pointed out, and, and many more. And so the, I think the key is to find those opportunities for upskilling our current workforce to make sure that our mechanics are able to also work in electrical vehicles, right? That there's both high-end opportunities for our PhDs coming out of the R1 universities, our master's students coming out of Cal State, you know, we have a fantastic um, environmental science program, like I mentioned, but also down at the community college level and high school to make sure that, it, you know, that there are the appropriate job opportunities for everybody within our region, right? So it's not just contained to a small group that are going to benefit from the, um, the opportunities here. And Nancy Sutley, can I ask you too, as you look at your programs and, and especially on the uh, clean energy and what you're trying to build out, how are you how are you seeing the gaps in workforce and the challenges with workforce? What are you looking for? Well, I, you know, it's a it's an important question. I think you know we have an amazing workforce uh, that does an incredible job of of keeping the lights on and the water running here in Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, you know, I think I think it's a, a couple of things. One, I think, is just the pace of change. Uh, so things are happening very quickly. So making sure that the workforce is uh, is able to keep up with those uh, with those changes. Um, I think it's not a secret that the the workforce uh, in the utility sector is is aging. Uh, so being able to bring in uh, um, folks who will be around for um, you know decades. Uh, LADWP has been a, a sort of employer of choice here in Los Angeles and has helped generations of Angelinos uh, get into the middle class and we want to make sure that that continues. So making sure that their skills are uh, following the, the latest trends, also making sure that as we spend money on um, you know sort of the transformation both internally and externally that it's supporting good jobs in the community uh, and uh, and we're able, you know, we, we literally spend billions of dollars every year uh, on, on capital projects and, uh, and, and on our workforce. And, and, and we want to make sure that Los Angeles benefits from that uh, economic activity. And speaking of economic activity, Amisha, you talked about, uh, about your study and the seven to one return on an investment if we were able to get a hundred billion in um, clean technology from stimulus money. So tell us a little bit more about that because you know the topic today is the green economy and economic recovery. That's a compelling number and we would love to have that uh, in California. Can you give us a little bit more information on what advice would you give us at not only in LA, LA County, Southern California, but California, how would we build something like that out? So I, I touched, on, touched on this a little bit. So the, the number itself, I would say, it was modeled after the potential for obviously a multi-trillion dollar stimulus. I think that the, the two trillion number was was out there for for a while. So that's sort of what what uh, the analysis group used as sort of the model. More, it could be less, right? I think the um, the potential for return on the investment is what's important in terms of ensuring that um, the dollars are going to the right buckets, right? That That is going to be key. And I think in the last, during the last uh, recession, when we, um, when California was given a significant, significant amount of money to devote toward clean energy projects, um, one of the, the keys to success during that time, and maybe Nancy can speak more to this, was the ability to get the dollars out as quickly as possible, right? And leverage existing programs um, where, where, where you have those in place and where you can get sort of that ripple effect in the local communities, I think it's going to be key. So I think, um, you know, I, I imagine the governor's office and other leaders in the state are really thinking about what those key programs are. How do you get sort of the maximum job impact and uh, benefits from uh, existing programs? And then where do you, is there an opportunity to create something new that can also leverage private funding um, so that you can actually do more with those dollars? So those are, I think at the local level, 
going to be important to really identify um, projects that are needed in communities where, where you see opportunities to um, work with, uh, you know, uh, economic development agencies, um, also to maybe partnerships with the community colleges in terms of workforce opportunities. I mean, these are all things that I think at the local level can help uh, provide input to state leaders. So as they're building out sort of the process um, and the allocation of these funds, that, that it's, it's, is done with local input. Um, and I'm sure others have thoughts on that, but that's, that's sort of how I would, um, you know, stage that conversation. Yeah, thank you. And Matt, uh, the same question to you. I know your team has done a tremendous amount of work um, on TEP, but also the follow-up with the stimulus ask. How do you see us taking advantage of, if we were to get, say, 100 billion? You know, how do we build out local jobs? How do we build out businesses? What are we gonna do with that? Yeah, and thank you, Judy and Bill, for signing on to that stimulus proposal when we sent a follow-up letter to congressional leadership in late June. Um, with our members of the Transportation Electrification Partnership in, in April, when the pandemic and related economic crisis first hit, we, we talked about how do we put forth a bold uh, vision and call to action, uh, similar to Misha, uh, sized on that idea of a $2 trillion infrastructure stimulus proposal that would, uh, in our proposal, we put forth is $150 billion for transportation electrification broadly. And I, I just would say, uh, as a, a very important aside, transportation electrification represents the most comprehensive opportunity uh, to really not only move to zero emissions, but to unlock innovation, to put people to work and, and restart our economy. And it touches more lives than, well, clean energy and 100% clean energy is an enormous transformation and transition. Uh, everybody touches transportation. Not everybody sees where their power comes from, although that's changing with more and more people put solar on the rooftops. Um, but EVs uh, and the, the grid uh, combined really touch everybody. So uh, we propose $25 billion for assembly and adoption of electric and zero emission vehicles, along with supply chain development. We have uh, the potential to get lithium out of the Salton Sea uh, from the geothermal power production out there. So that's an opportunity across the country. $85 billion for charging stations and, of course, the grid upgrades along the way. Um, and that's uh, broken down uh, in our proposal. You can see that uh, online um, between heavy duty, uh, transit, uh, light duty, as well as the overall utility upgrades. $25 billion for zero emissions public transit and school buses um, and safe streets because uh, you know, we all experienced here in LA and communities across the country that, wow, were the streets during the pandemic, one of the small several linings was the streets were quieter and safer and the air was cleaner. Um, so as we uh, look towards the future, how do we help move in that direction across the board? Um, and safe streets are critical to getting people comfortable and walking and biking as part of active transit. Next thing we asked for is $12.5 billion for workforce development, safety standards, and job training, including a billion of that for apprenticeship programs uh, that we work with IBW and other labor partners to identify. And then finally, $2.5 billion for the innovation ecosystems, for clean tech startups, supporting underrepresented founders and owners of small businesses and, and startups, and, and really putting forth pilot dollars that can move more quickly uh, the, then uh, with trusted partners, uh, then necessarily putting it all, all the funding through procurement. So we estimated with HRNA, the economic advisory firm that worked with us on this and some other projects, they estimated 2.3 million jobs could be created, hundreds of thousands, uh, of course, in California. And 1.4 million of those jobs nationwide would just be on, of course, the utility upgrades and building out that charging infrastructure. So we need to work on the pipeline of, of, of workforce as well. Does that, uh, does that give you heartburn, Dr. Prager, to talk about the pipeline of jobs needed for, you know, we're very concerned on how do we build back the economy uh, and businesses straight up from the startups to, to innovative companies, our cluster of electric vehicles, buses, trams, uh, trucks that we've got in the region. But as we all know, we need that pipeline of workers. So we're getting some of the qu specific questions on workforce. If, I, if you could take a minute and answer what, what in particular is needed as far as specific occupations in the green economy and what upskilling is needed? I'm gonna ask you, and then I'm gonna ask Nancy Sutley too um, on that specific question. 
Sure. So it, it, it doesn't give me heartburn. It actually gives me a lot of excitement. The idea that we could be providing, you know, our students, our community members with these opportunities, you know, and we all know that the, the pandemic and the, you know, the subsequent recession have really impacted certain communities particularly hardly. And so it, with particular um, negative impacts, and that's something that hopefully these kind of goals and these kind of dreams, if you will, can bring back these, um, you know, bring back jobs to much needed areas um, in our community. And so in terms of specifics, you know, as Amisha mentioned earlier, there's, you know, a number of key areas that we see opportunities in and AE, you have done some fantastic work in this area to identify those. Um, you know, in particular, we're seeing the need for um, for growth in that automated and um, electric vehicle sector. And so any training that can be provided in that area, it's a relatively new sector. And so because we haven't yet seen the rollout of the, um, the technologies on a wide scale, there'll definitely be substantial opportunities for, for example, car mechanics to transition over into that, that area. Um, as was mentioned, you know, uh, charging stations, there's going to be the need for training in not just the engineering of those, but also um, the, uh, the operation. Uh, we're also going to need to see development in battery storage manufacturing and um, rollout. So there's, there's just a few areas, but, uh, you know, I'm going to reiterate, there are so many opportunities here that it would take the kind of reporting that AE do, <laughs> the kind of work that Matt and others and, um, on this call do, in order to lay out every single opportunity available. And Nancy Sutley, can you also answer that question? What specific occupations do you uh, are you seeing that are needed to fill the pipeline? Well, I mean, we need we need uh, you know uh, utility workers. Uh, and as I said, our, our workforce is aging. These are great jobs, um, but they take a lot of training. So it's a, a fairly long apprenticeship. Uh, period. Uh, we train them and then they get snapped up by other utilities uh, because we train them so well. Uh, and so there's just, I think, nationwide a shortage of workers to do, you know, uh, climb poles and, and, uh, and maintain the grid and expand the grid and make the grid do all the things we, we want the grid to do. Um, we started about a dozen years ago a program called the uh, Utility Pre-Craft Trainee Program uh, to try to help um, uh, members of the community get the skills necessary to uh, compete for jobs here at LADWP. And so we put uh, hundreds of people through this program. Uh, they learn uh, on the job skills. Um, we've also been working with uh, some of the community colleges, including LA Trade Tech, uh, to help us with our apprenticeship and getting people uh, in the door. Uh, and then also uh, trying as we as we uh, spend money on pr programs outside of our uh, workforce, for example, some of our energy efficiency programs, uh, uh, we require union labor um, for those programs because uh, we think in terms of sending uh, people into people's businesses to make changes in the buildings that we wanna make sure they're the highest quality workers, uh, keep the jobs local. Um, so, you know, I think for us, it's just really the pipeline of people who are, are trained and skilled in these areas uh, and understand that these are, um, you know, they're, they're excellent jobs, they pay an excellent wage, uh, and they, they can sustain a family uh, in, in Los Angeles, and uh, we just encourage people to come and check us out. And Nancy Ander, you talked a bit about uh, um, you're growing by uh, growing by a lot, and you need a lot. So, what in vendors as well as workforce? What specific occupations are do you see that are needed to fulfill that pipeline? So, let me give an example on the electric infrastructure side. We start from needing someone to go out to the site to do an assessment. That could be an engineer. It could just be a um, someone skilled in the construction area, but they do an assessment to look at the site, identify what the needs are in terms of panel capacity, transformer needs, et cetera. Um, then it goes on to having designers. Again, that could be engineers, but it doesn't have to be designers that actually design the infrastructure. 
from there it goes to a regulatory body. So we need inspectors that are reviewing plans or actually going out and doing site inspections that typically is in the public sector, but it could be you know private contracting. From there it goes to construction. So you need construction managers, you need people actually doing the construction, the contracting work. Um, and then you need people on the on the operations and maintenance side, people that know how to understand these systems, whether they're renewables or electric infrastructure, charging stations, whatever they are. You need people on an ongoing basis doing the maintenance and operation and repair of these systems. So there's a <clears throat> there's a whole life cycle of, of workforce needs within this area, and it's not just for electric infrastructure. Same thing applies for renewables as well. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of educa educators on the line and they're very interested in what are the specific occupations. So thank you for taking a minute to answer those questions. But let's step back a minute and look at another, um, another issue that we all talk about in advanced transportation and is really deep on our heart and that is environmental justice. You know, Mary Nichols from CARB um, has said that when we work on the green economy, we're also, we're working on good paying jobs. We're building out a supply chain in Southern California. We're building out new technology, but we're, it, we're addressing the environmental issues. And just to put this in perspective, you know, right now, this year, we've had so many big issues such as the wildfires, the pandemic and uh, Black Lives Matter. So to put this in perspective, there have been 1.6 million deaths related to COVID. Uh, and you put that up next to 5 million deaths related to uh, unclean air in 2017. 5 million versus 1.6 million. This is a really e enormous issue. And that's what is driving a lot of our policy and driving this ecosystem of growth. But you know, it's a win-win on so many different levels. But when we look at who it's impacting, it's Im impacting African-Americans three times more than average people. So this brings up questions of environmental justice and how do we get clean technology to underserved communities? How do we really make an impact with the brown and black communities that we are very much focused on as we look to grow this economy? So I'm gonna um, ask Amisha, because uh, you're our, our policy person, could you, could you address that? I know it's a big issue, but um, where can we make an impact on policy? So I, I would say I, I see, um, so thank you for that question. It's uh, absolutely, um, now more than ever, I think we're uh, having to take a look at what we've done so far. We're in um, and I, from, from my vantage point, I see the opportunity for, um, you know, three sort of key stakeholders to do more work together, quite frankly. And I think that's uh, our industry, right? So the industry that is uh, looking to do more in the state and expand um, in terms of business opportunity and jobs, but also obviously working with this, these actual communities that are heavily burdened by, um, you know, fossil fuel, uh, the, the impacts of fossil fuel generation and um, other other impacts that they're dealing with on a daily basis, and then labor. I think these these three sort of stakeholder communities. Now is the time to really find where where we can work together to um, to to ensure that the jobs that are created in these communities are good jobs, right? That are that are well paying jobs. That um, not only are these communities that we're not only are we trying to build more projects in these communities so that they can benefit for cleaner air ensuring that they're also getting the jobs, right? There is a pathway for these communities and the residents of these communities to transition um, from maybe traditional fossil fuel jobs to this, this cleaner economy. Ensuring that we're actually addressing those challenges head on because we think, um, you know, working in the silos is not gonna, is not gonna address this issue. But I think that, um, and, and it's hard. There are challenges and I think there's, there's we have to think about it in a different way. We have to be open to hard conversations about what this means for businesses, opportunity, um, where we go, where we where we do our business. But I think that um, that's 
that's going to be critical. Um, and that's what we've been talking to our membership about. Um, and I'm, I'm sure others have been having similar conversations about how to really ensure that we are, when we're doing policy development, we're thinking, we're asking the right questions, we're bringing in the right partners for those conversations, and we're bridging these gaps, or we're at least trying to address these gaps that have historically, I think, been overlooked I don't think on purpose, but I think unintentionally, and, and some of that has had consequences. So I'll stop there um, and would love to see if other folks have reactions to that. And thank you. And Matt, I know you've got some pilot projects uh, specifically serving the underserved, but we also have a question coming in. They, uh, a, a, a participant wants to know where they can read your stimulus request as well as your TEP proposal. Yeah, then go to leci.org backslash TEP stimulus, TEP stimulus, um, and uh, see if we can put it in the chat. Um, yeah, our organization, our mission is to create an inclusive green economy. And, 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 and a couple of ways we've been working on that is represented by what I mentioned earlier is our workforce training program. We're, um, many of the participants we've had, you know, uh, oh, oh, well over 150 in the last year are formerly incarcerated um, from black and brown communities under uh, underrepresented uh, parts of the green workforce. Um, and they're being trained on, on everything from CAD software, project management software to IT. Uh, and, and that's because uh, when a EV charger goes down, it's often nothing to do with the electrical components, although they get electrical uh, safety training to, to, to work on the units. It's to do with the IT connection, the Wi-Fi, the backhaul, um, a data logger, and, and that's what they're learning. So those skills are obviously transferable to other sectors, but that's what's needed as well. And then they, you know, just basic stuff like they clean the chargers. Um, the uh, other thing that we're working on among other, well, also looking to support underrepresented founders in the startup and, and as well as small business community who have a tougher time getting access to capital. So how do we help women and people of color break through those barriers? They're, they're historical, they're racial, they're gender-based, they're uh, institutional. How do we help them uh, do that? And that's a big piece of our work with startups. But on um, Lacey's commitment to working in disadvantaged communities with the Transportation Electrification Partnership and some partners in the state legislature, we've been able to secure some funding and go out and deploy pilots in particular uh, in disadvantaged communities where we're bringing zero emissions mobility solutions. Uh, and currently we're deploying these in Lamert Park, uh, Pacoima, uh, San Pedro at a housing authority uh, development there and in North Long Beach. Um, those are neighborhoods that don't have adequate access to mobility. They, they are not, they're neighborhoods where you don't see scooters or e-bikes dropped off on the corner in the morning. You don't see a car in the parking spot, let alone an electric vehicle for everybody. You know, so not everybody's access to these. So that's why we've put an EV car share. Uh, we've put an e-bike uh, share and uh, EV shuttles and looking at some other innovations, e-cargo bikes uh, to bring to these neighborhoods and work with our partners in the transit agencies and the state government, uh, the legislature to fund uh, the scaling of these solutions. And you're seeing uh, LA just won a, uh, a grant from CARB called STEP that uh, is gonna focus on Limerick Park. So it's gonna follow on this initial pilot we're doing with e-bikes and the EV shuttle in this historic black neighborhood in the middle of LA. Um, and, and, and that's why our partners and members have prioritized this is, is how do we bring these solutions because upward economic mobility is really tied to access to transportation and mo mobility. So that's why you know, DWP and all of our partners, the mayor, uh, the county, CAR, uh, SCE have prioritized um, environmental justice and racial justice through the work we're doing in these pilots. And I would love to ask that question to all the panelists, but I'm getting the notice that it's time. So um, I want to uh, take the last couple minutes and thank all of our panelists. I, I, I really appreciate you taking your time to talk to us about your programs and what the green economy means for each of your departments and firms and what how you're reaching out to the workforce, building the workforce and the ecosystem. Um, but I'd like to end our panelists with asking you all to unmute. And I'd like to end with a rapid fire one, one word answer to this question. So if you will all unmute and you get one word, 
to answer this question, how do you see the future of the green economy? In one word, Nancy Sutley. Uh, very bright. Well, that's two words, sorry, bright. Dr. Prager. Exciting. Matt. Diverse. Nancy Ander. Growing. Amisha. Echo. All right, well, thank you all. And we're gonna sign off here. Um, thank you participants for joining us today. And I hope that you enjoyed uh, hearing from all of our panelists as well as our speakers. And thank you, um, CSU Dominguez Hills. So we just wanna say thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming and stay safe, mask up and happy holidays uh, six feet apart. Have a good Tuesday. You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills.